Given the advantage of hindsight, it seems fair to say that Jacques Derrida retained an enduring interest in the question of human exceptionalism throughout his career. A thinker of origins, we should not be surprised by his forensic attention to what is particular about human genesis, those capacities whose unique achievement and comparative complexity are purportedly without precedent. Our analytical interest in this meditation will focus on the radical break that separates human identity from its others. Does it actually exist? And what are the implications if we fail to find an inaugural signature that authorises this extraordinary status? Derrida will argue that the reasoning that motors all of Western metaphysics rests on the belief that human identity is isolated and irreconcilably alienated. It then makes sense to explain human exceptionalism as a special case of perversion, a unique status which is essentially unnatural. The scene of human arrival, cut adrift, as Derrida says, with an axe, as if with an axe, from its surrounding history and environment, is routinely explained in terms of error, corruption, mistake. I have written elsewhere of Jean Hippolyte's attempt to indemnify the human as a special case in the face of Derrida's insistence that nature writes, a suggestion that calls into question the acquisition of language as a unique capacity in human self-definition. Here we might think of language as patterns of discernment, which I think is a better way to think of language. It's, it's the question of patternment. Patternments of discernment that are biological, environmental, even geological, wherein nature's metamorphoses manifest the play of legibility, the materialization of systems in potential. Importantly, although Hippolyte is persuaded by Derrida's argument and concedes nature's literacy, he balks at the accompanying suggestion that nature could possess agency, intention, or by implication, even forethought. This sense of an organizing center or subjectivity is normally assumed when we refer to reading and writing. And for this reason, Hippolyte is understandably puzzled. It seems that nature may write randomly, as if by chance, or even programmatically, for both possibilities could involve a sort of technological facility which, despite complex outcomes, would lack conscious intent. However, according to Hippolyte, human literacy represents agential and intentional capacities that are radically different from the contents of what could only be a form of proto or automatic writing. Surely the very assumption that language means that it has significance is what renders it synonymous with human accomplishment. Given this, Hippolyte wonders how we should understand the workings of a non-human language and he asks, can this sign without sense, this perpetual turning back, be understood in the light of a kind of philosophy of nature in which nature will not only have realised a mutation but will have realised a perpetual mutant, man? That is, a kind of error of transmission or of malformation would have created a being which is always malformed, whose adaptation is a perpetual aberration, and the problem of man would become part of a much larger field. So he believes he's, he's actually wanting to agree with um, his student. Derrida was his student at that time. I want to explore this suggestion, commonly held, that the human is inherently unnatural, a perpetual aberration, whose bastard identity and ontological difference from the rest of life represent a continuing and unprecedented threat to life. Of course, the corollary here is that the unique capacity to choose and to decide on the fortunes of life could, just possibly, exercise a reversal of such prospects, answering menace with salvation. However, before investigating the specifics of this seemingly capricious power game, some general observations can be made. 